We're here today in the old engine room of Thomas Street Fire Station. Now, Thomas Street is 100 years old this year. It opened on the 21st of January in 1913. It was planned from 1898. It was part of a series of fire stations that the then Chief Officer, Captain Purcell, uh, wanted to put in place in Dublin. He decided to divide the city into quarters and put a fire station in each one. When he took over the brigade in 1892, there were only two fire stations, both on the south side of the city. One close to here in Whitehorse Yard, which is down off Wine Tavern Street, and the other was the old headquarters building. The Wine Tavern Street station was actually the, the oldest station in the city. Uh, it went back before the fire brigade, it went back to the days of the Waterworks Brigade with the when the corporation uh, had put an engine in there in the 1850s and uh, men from the waterworks department used it. Uh, one of the disadvantages was that it was on a very steep hill and in the event of a fire the fireman had to walk beside the horse because the horse couldn't pull both fire, fire engine and, and, uh, and its crew up the hill. It actually had the shortest operational life of any of the city's fire stations. Uh, Porcel's other stations would have stayed in use into the 70s, 80s and even in the case of Tara Street into the 90s. Uh, this station, when it was opened, it was a revolutionary station in that it was the first Dublin fire station built with no provision for horses. This was to be a motorised uh, fire station. The brigade bought its second motor fire engine to come in here, a Leyland RI uh, 2080 was stationed in here. It was part of the move, Porcel's move, to motorise and modernise the Dublin Fire Brigade. When it did open, of course, 1913 was, was a seminal year in Dublin history, it's the year of the lockout. So from this station you had people responding to things like the Church Street housing collapse across the river. They would also have been up through the city at the various things that were happening in connection with the, the uh, Bloody Sunday riots. There was a lot of fires both within the area and outside the area. Dublin Fire Brigade at the time, Dublin Corporation, was the city within the canals and it up went from here down to Kilmainham. So anything beyond that wasn't our area. It was the county, the council area, and the Dublin Fire Brigade weren't required to, to go to them, unless by arrangement and unless the whoever called them agreed to pay the charges. But you find some very odd fires that year. You find them going to farm fires in places that we don't think of as farm and land, like Crumlin and Walkenstone. Uh, a lot of these fires were incendiary fires where crops, oats and hay were burned by uh, farm labourers who were locked out as part of the, the uh, 1913 dispute. Uh, scab labour was being used on a lot of the farms. An attempt to organise farm labourers was being opposed by farmers. So the chief officer in his own private report, his private notes for the annual report that year, uh, described a lot of these fires as due to uh, as he put it, Larkinism. On the 24th of April 1916, the brigade, the section from here, turned out to the first fire at the Rising, the fire in the magazine fort in the Phoenix Park. A squad of volunteers had taken over the magazine fort. They were unable to get access to the ammunition and explosives, but they had lit fires in the magazine fort. The brigade from here responded to that. Over the course of Easter week, like the rest of the Dublin Fire Brigade, they were on continuous duty. It was the busiest week in the brigade's history to that point. One of the major fires that they fought from Thomas Street was down at the corner of Bridge Street and Usher's Quay on the Wednesday of Easter week. The buildings there were being used by the Dublin Fusiliers as it gave them a, a vantage point to fire into the forecourts. At 4 a.m. on the, the, the morning of the Wednesday, Two volunteers, uh, Paddy Clancy and a volunteer, Tom Smart, crossed the bridge carrying cans of petrol under fire, uh, broke into the ground floor of the buildings being used by the Fusiliers and set fire to them and then they withdrew back to the forecourts. The fire got slightly out of control and burned not alone that building but the entire block around it. Um, oddly enough, Tom Smart, the, one of the two volunteers who did that, was the son of a fireman himself and would later join the Dublin Fire Brigade while he was still an active IRA volunteer and was very active as a member of the brigade during the War of Independence. Uh, the whole week 
there was a series of massive fires. The whole centre of Dublin burned. The fires joined up in what Porcel called the Great Fire from about the Thursday. The whole city centre was burning. The biggest fire of the revolutionary period that they would have dealt with, and it involves this room, actually was the, was the Custom House fire on the 25th of May 1921. The IRA decided to burn the customs house and not alone destroyed the local government board records, but also to make the point that they could strike at will in the centre of the capital, take over an area, isolate it and operate. Part of the plan involved closing down the city's fire stations to make sure that they couldn't respond immediately to it. At this period, quite a number of the city's firemen were members of either the Irish Volunteers, the IRA, or the Irish Citizen Army. So taking over the fire stations was probably an easier project than you might think. In the case of here in Thomas Street, members of the 1st Battalion uh, came, they took over the station, held it for 25 minutes. They left, dressed as firemen, uh, drove the fire engine off, and uh, they abandoned it and the uniforms above in Crumlin. Now, when it was recovered from Crumlin, it was torn out to the custom house. And actually, one of the firemen from here, Jack Cavanagh, in the course of the fire in the custom house, discovered four IRA men hiding within the building, which of course was on fire at this stage, and was also surrounded by the auxiliaries and British military. So uh, Jack Cavanagh arranged for another volunteer within the brigade, uh, Michael Rogers, to go back to Tara Street and to round up some spare uniforms, which were smuggled into the custom house. The IRA men were dressed in those and brought out to the British military cordon and got away from the scene. They also actually recovered arms that had been dumped by the volunteers as they were leaving the customs house and they were returned to the, to the IRA Brigade Quartermaster. The, 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 the revolution, the revolutionary period came to a brief uh, end with the truce but of course in the following year the civil war started off again Thomas Street would have been in the thick of that over at the fire in the Four Courts and then again later at the fire in the block in O'Connell Street. And again we have a number of members, some of whom actually left the brigade and reported for service with the, with the Republican forces. Other men were operating as couriers and intelligence agencies uh, or intelligence agents on behalf of the, the anti-treaty IRA. At the end of the fighting in Dublin, um, the brigade reverted to normal duties. The civil war, the fighting in the civil war had largely moved elsewhere, although there were still incendiary attacks within the city. But the, the 20s were a kind of a bleak economic time. The city itself was now being run by commissioners. The Free State had fallen out with Dublin Corporation and had uh, prorogued the corporation and appointed commissioners to run the city. Uh, I think in Ernest Blythe's words, the corporation at the time were made up of a bunch of what he called reds and irregulars, and he had no intention of dealing with them. There was major austerity measures, major cutbacks and major lack of funding. Uh, the brigade, of course, suffered quite heavily from that. And in one of the last fires, one of the last serious fires attended by the crews from Thomas Street, uh, the brigade paid the price of those cutbacks. On uh, the 5th of October 1936, there was a major fire in Pierce Street. Uh, the Thomas Street section was torn down to it. While they were travelling towards it, the tenement houses which were on fire had a factory in the basement, a battery factory, where gas cylinders were stored. The fire reached the gas cylinders, the building blew up and three firemen lost their lives there. Uh, Bob Malone, Tom Nugent and Peter McArdle. When Thomas Street's crew arrived, their basic task was to recover the, 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 the bodies of their comrades. Uh, in 1938, a new chief officer, Major Comerford, decided that he needed to redraw the boundaries of the Dublin Fire Brigade, both to save money and to plan forward. And because the corporation were planning major tenement clearances in the city and were going to build new suburbs in places like Crumlin, Ballyferm and Cabra on the outskirts, that this station in Thomas Street would no longer be needed. So in 1938, he decided to shut the station down because a new station in Dolphins Barn was due to be built in 1939. So he decided to shut the station down, move crews out of here. He kept it as a backup fire station because 
the war clouds were on the horizon and he decided that this could be used as a training centre for the Auxiliary Fire Service and the Air Raid Precautions. There were actually Auxiliary Firemen and women, for the first time women were taken in and trained in the Dublin Fire Brigade. Some of the men attached here would have gone to Belfast in, on the night of the 14th to 15th of April 1941 when the Luftwaffe blitzed Belfast and the Northern Government were forced to ask for help from the South. Uh, Dublin Fire Brigade sent six engines, three of which were regular fire service and three of them made up of AFS to Belfast. They went again on the 5th of May after a, a further raid. That was really the last hurrah for this place. It closed in 1945, the doors shut as a fire station. It led other lives and at the moment it's gone on to feature again as the, the headquarters of the National College of Art and Design. So it's found a new lease of life. Um, the station, the more than Thomas Street, had a long gestation from 1898 when it was planned to 1909 when it should have been built. The station that was going to replace it in 1939 wasn't actually built until 1964, so again, there's a bit of a gap. <laughs> Thank you.